so Saturdays, uh, when I was a kid, Saturdays, I used to go into the computer lab for like eight hours straight. And this is back when you had a pet 2K computer, like a 2K of memory, Atari mm-hmm. 400. Uh, the ZX81. ZX81, the Sinclair, right? Yeah. And, and there was a Teladon, a little terminal, which was like pre-internet and so on. Mm. And I would uh, try and create Missile Command through ASCII characters, and I would create Zork adventure games, and I would uh, create uh, uh, spaceship fighting games, and, uh, and I was in doing that, and I loved it. I, I, I loved it. And uh, I remember one time the, the, the teacher couldn't show up. You just needed another adult there. Begged my mom to come. Oh, mom, please, 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 right? And that's what I did for years. Learned how to code. Learned how these machines worked. So then, years later, I could sit down in front of a computer and code. And code and code and code. And build some, build some great code. Build some great, great stuff. Really innovative stuff. And um, as a result, I had a lot of intellectual capital when I went into the business world. I knew how computers worked, knew how coding worked, uh, knew how to design and build some pretty great and pretty maintainable stuff. Some, some of my code base is still being used. And um, that's a choice. And, and other people went to the mall. Now, I didn't have any money, right? So I couldn't really go to the mall, right? What's that old Kevin Smith line? They're not there to work. They're not there to shop. They're just there. <laughs> and... Um, so the people who went to the mall, you know, they got to eat their greasy pizza and uh, they got to roam around and browse through the record store and they got to um, hang out and, and, you know, it was fun, I guess. Wouldn't be for me, but it was fun for them. And I went and learned how to code. And what comes out of that when you're in your 20s? Well, I got a career. And to other people, I guess... They're still at the mall. <laughs> and these are just choices. I don't resent their fun. I don't know why they would resent my career. But that gen- generally seems to be that, oh, shit, moment. Oh, shit. <laughs> I have no e- economic value. Something's wrong with the system. And this is true not just – and the last thing I'll say because I know I'm rambling. But this is true not just of people who don't have economic value. It's people who've not developed the most important human capital of all, which has nothing to do with economics and everything to do with emotional maturity, with the ability to uh, motivate people, with the ability to enroll people in something important, with the ability to get things done and, and foster loyalty uh, and, and to negotiate and uh, empathize but without being weak. So all the work that I did – and look, I mean, please, I, I've said this a million times before. I am no business genius. I am no – you know, I mean, you don't see me living in a – uh, a, a seascape of uh, infinite riches, but I was, you know, willing to to, to do some work and did did fairly well. And um, being willing to to do that stuff, it's 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 fair. Life is is pretty fair. I make as much money doing this as is fair. And people who add more value to their projects make a lot, lot more money than I do. And that's perfectly fair. It's perfectly fair. And I, I just, I invite everyone to review the, the, the very chilling possibility that life is a lot more fair than you think it is. And I'm not talking about like getting government contracts and glad handing. I just mean in terms of your life and your success. It, it, it's not the sole definer. There is good and bad luck and and so on. But there is a lot more fairness, I think. And the selling of the unfairness of the system is, is, is a pathogen in society. It's a pathogen in society. When you normalize in society, when you normalize by things that people are afraid to normalize by, by like IQ and stuff – Things even out pretty well. There's a lot more fairness in the world than people think, especially in the countries that are still vaguely free. So the last thing I'd say is so the people who had fun rather than going to the computer lab and and coding till their eyes watered, 
well, later on, they can take my money, but I can't go back and take their fun. That's the fundamental reason why a state can't work, because a state will always become redistributionist. It's absolutely inevitable. There's no other possibility in any way, shape, or form, because there'll always be people who choose the easy route. There'll always be people who choose fun over work. Because I had some computer skills, I became a temp and worked in offices. And then, uh, oh, one summer I was a gardener. Uh, I weeded people's gardens because it was a recession and <laughs> I had no job skills to speak of. And I also ended up taking somebody's uh, grandmother around town uh, from sort of a, 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 a tourist guide for hire. And uh, sort of odd jobs like that. Uh, I did a variety of, uh, you know, just jobs that ha- the jobs that have no name, right? <laughs> moving office furniture for, for a weekend and that kind of stuff. And which actually helped me to understand that it's kind of incomprehensible to me how people who do that for a living have fingers still, but that's another matter. Uh, and then I, uh, then I started moving into the professional realm. I started uh, semi-professional. I was like, a, I'd learned WordPerfect and, and, uh, and so on. So I started doing those kinds of jobs. And then um, uh, I really got desperate after uh, I uh, didn't have a job and had graduated, and I just, I remember phoning up uh, a woman that I'd met who'd given me a temp, some temp job or two, and I was just totally broke and no money, and I remember the, uh, 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 Marnie her name was, and I remember leaving a message, sort of like, okay, Marnie, I need a job, I'm desperate, I will, uh, something to do with computers would be great, I don't care really at this point if it's, if it's moving computers or cleaning computers or, uh, or, uh, <laughs> You know, re- re- reaching around and cleaning the inside of computers, or you know, but anything. I need to. I need to eat. And uh, she ended up sending me on a job, and I'd already uh, done some work on the side to, uh, which ended up being the company called Caribou, which I co-founded with my brother. And um, she sent me on a job for a COBOL programmer, and it's because I had learned programming uh, and was a programmer uh, with some credible, at least some credible effects of programming. And I became a COBOL programmer for about a year uh, while working on this other job on the side. And then I quit and I uh, started uh, uh, this other company, which then grew and did very well. And so on. It's still running. Um, well, look, I didn't, I didn't run the business side of things. I did uh, R&D, uh, programming, a little bit of marketing, more marketing later in my career. I did sales, technical presentations. But I will say this, that nobody asked to see my programming license. I basically, as you know, I started a company with my brother and we grew it to a couple of million dollars a year. And um, we sold it and... Uh, I was basically, and I I knew that the board was corrupt. I knew that they had lied, and uh, I continued to sell shares. uh, And uh, I claimed that uh, I just didn't know, and I worked hard, and I, you know. So even though I knew that the uh, business management was corrupt uh, and false, uh, I continued to sell shares and make money. The shares peaked. Uh, They started off at $0.08. They peaked at $2.40, and I sold a bunch on the way up, and I sold a bunch at the top. And then they crashed down and basically evaporated and, and so on. And uh, so it was a pump and dump, right, as I sort of found out the technical term for it later. And I gave myself all the excuses in the world, right? I gave myself all the excuses in the world. I worked hard. It wasn't my fault. The software worked. The technical team was great. blah de blah blah But uh, nonetheless, my conscience got me, right? I mean, you can... You can squeal, right? But you're still on the spit. My brother was, uh, you know, that it's perfectly legitimate, that yes, uh, they're, uh, they're selling a story, but that's what stock promotion is all about. And, you know, so my brother, who was, you know, had 10 years of experience relative to me more in business, was the one leading me down the garden path. That... Uh, process uh, got me. Uh, basically, I did make a long story semi short. I uh, left the company. I um, left my girlfriend. I ceased to see my brother. I ceased to see my mother uh, all within the span of uh, six to eight months, I think it was. Because uh, when I, and I was in therapy, right? I was in therapy because I couldn't sleep. 
right? So this was not... And so I know how hard it is to make these choices. I didn't sort of wake up one morning and say, what, oh, I think I'm going to be a, a healthier human being. I'm off, I'm toodling after therapy now. Cheerio. Uh, no, it was a desperate... Uh, it was a situation of desperation, right? I mean, I had been chugging along. Life had been working well. I'd been very successful. Actually, I shouldn't say I'd been successful. I shouldn't say very successful because lots of people out there who made a lot more money than I did. But... I had been successful, and I had achieved things that I had never dreamed of, and uh, so things were chugging along, right? As I was earlier this week, I'm in a boardroom with a VC eating up the oxygen, telling me what a great guy he is and how my resume isn't a perfect fit for the position. Although, of course, uh, I had just, I had the meeting with this VC earlier this week, and a venture capitalist, and uh, he said, well, you know, it's not a perfect fit for the position. And I said, well, what's your, you know, and he already told me his history. And I said, well, was yours? You know, I don't mean to sound confrontational, but was yours a perfect fit? Because you're a CEO. You don't have an MBA. Uh, you don't have a degree in economics or finance or business management, right? Uh, and, uh, and you're doing a VC thing. And I said, I fully respect that. But, of course, if you applied that, if they'd applied that criteria to hiring you rather than um, what they did do was recognize your talent, energy, and intelligence, then you wouldn't have gotten this job. And I assume that you're effective because you're interviewing me. So I think that uh, this sort of, it's got, I've got to walk through a particular kind of outline might not be valid for this position, maybe. I mean, I'm just sort of putting it out there, but... And, of course, uh, he didn't really like that. I didn't really think that I was going to get the job, so I just sort of wanted to point out that it's kind of hypocritical when you've wandered in cross-field with no experience uh, in your resume to get you the position, but then you're in there and you start interviewing other people who obviously have a lot of skill and ability. And he recognized, he said, you know, skill, uh, skill and ability you've got in spades. But I just sort of found it funny that he would then say, but, you know, it's not a perfect resume fit. It's like, really, that's... That's all you've got, <laughs> you know. If it was a perfect resume fit, why would I need to be interviewed, right? I mean, you you interview to find out if I'm intelligent. But anyway, so I don't think I'm going to get that one, and I don't think I wanted it. Uh, once you get that kind of stuff in an interview. I was actually supposed to have received an answer um, to some degree about what kind of transition is going to be occurring for work at me from my boss. Um, the question is whether I'm just going to quit outright or whether I'm going to do like two or three days a week for a little while at my job and uh, work on uh, the, to sort of finish up the business plan and get, get everything ready to roll. I hope to have an answer um, this week. But I, um, I'm sort of trying to play this, this thing, right, wherein I don't really like my job. Uh, I don't think they really like me too much. And uh, so, but, you know, I, I'm trying to sort of be as accommodating as possible because I wouldn't mind another uh, couple of weeks of uh, part-time work to uh, sort of help me finish the business plan, make the transition, have a little bit of extra cash to start with. And so uh, I will hopefully find out this week. So I've been sort of waiting for this company to get back to me about part-time work, and there's not been any particular mention of it. There's not been any particular mention of anything else either. So I'm going to have to take my fate and my future in my own hands and do something a little bit more proactive but I'm telling you it is a thousand mile walk to that exit ramp uh, from this this life this life that I've lived for the past I guess 10 or 11 years of being in the business world 